so we'll go ahead and, and start now. Let me pray. Father God, we thank you uh, that this world belongs to you and that you are completely sovereign over it and that uh, whatever may happen is not a surprise or a shock to you, but uh, you work even evil for good um, because you are sovereign over all things. And uh, God, we pray that you would do that um, in the case of what we're going to talk about today. We pray that, um, I pray that issue one uh, would be defeated and I pray that we are clear today as to why. Um, and I pray that you, Spirit, would help us do that. Um, and God, I pray for all the people who are here that uh, no matter what they may or may not think about uh, this particular matter, um, I pray that um, I pray that your glory and your direction from your word would be made known. Um, and that any confusion would be cleared up. Um, and that uh, uh, People would go to the polls as uh, followers of Christ, mm -hmm. um, ready to be that even inside the poll and not just in the rest of our lives in other ways. So pray for all that today in your name. Amen. 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 All right. So um, I think I know everybody's here, but I'll introduce myself anyway. My, my name is Ken Raffer, and um, I am an associate pastor here at New Albany Presbyterian Church. I, I'm also a recovering attorney, so um, I, was, I was a lawyer for about a decade um, before I decided to make a change, and so um, that doesn't completely qualify me to be here today, but enough when, when you look across the spectrum, and because I have help. So uh, Greg Malik is here, who is an attorney, um, an elder who served on our session before, who has thought a lot about and looked into these issues very, um, very thoroughly. Um, I can promise you that because I reviewed <laughs> what it is that he's going to say, and I'm grateful to him for that. So I'm going to start, and I'll talk for a little while. Um, then Greg uh, will come up and speak for longer than that um, because what he has to say is very important. And then I'll come up and, and say a little bit more before we kind of end this time and open it up for for questions. And so that's what we're going to do today as we talk about the legal and cultural implications of issue one. And uh, this might raise what I think is a threshold question in your mind is, can we really do this? I mean, can we even have this particular meeting? And what I mean by that is, um, as I have begun to talk to people about these things, in some cases, there's initial reaction of, well, the churches can talk about these matters. Has anyone expected or heard that or maybe thought that? A, a couple little nods, okay. So um, that's a good question, I think, right? Because um, we, should, we should have an answer for that question if it's out there. And uh, so let's go, let's go through it a little bit. Some of you are familiar with the, um, uh, the Center for Christian Virtue. Everybody, some? Okay, so that, that is a, um, it's a political organization. <coughs> Uh, a conservative political organization uh, that represents Christian interests in the state of Ohio. And uh, they have an excellent guide that you can go and look at to answer this question. It's available right on their website. But here are some of the things that, that it says. So partisan activity is completely prohib is prohibited completely, including engaging in any activity in support of or opposition to a candidate for political office or involvement in the political campaign of a candidate. However, some nonpartisan activity, particularly voter registration and voter education, is allowed. So voter registration, if we wanted to register people today, we could. Um, I believe the deadline for registration has already passed, so hopefully everybody who's in this room has already registered to vote. Uh, voter education about who can vote and how you vote and all those things, as well as um, what is on the ballot, is something that, that we can do. But there's another category that also wasn't addressed in this, which is legislative activity. Now, churches actually can engage in legislative activity in what is a limited sense. And so uh, here's what they say about that. Legislative activity is an activity intended to influence legislation, such as bills before the US Congress or state legislature, on and on and on, to referendum, something that is on the ballot for people to vote on, these activities include directly contacting elected officials about legislation, or not doing in this case, urging church members and others to communicate with legislators about legislation, 
to be similar to what we're doing and circulating petitions related to that legislation. And here is why. The IRS, which grants us our 501c3 status, has a kind of somewhat unclear, but at least in one sense is very clear threshold for how much influence on legislation churches can actually engage in and still qualify for nonprofit tax status. And a fairly safe gauge is to limit legislative activity to less than 5% of the church's overall activity. Now the reason that CCB has that on their website is, it, is because the IRS has a string of cases on this particular matter. And when they have, any time the activity has been clearly under 5% of what that church does or spends its time on, they've found that that is fine. And in one case, they actually found all the way up to almost 20% of the activity was fine, but that makes safe if you stay under 5 So the question, what is the estimated NAPC legislative activity, right? Yeah, that is a great, great question. So here we go. Prior to 2023, 0.00%. <laughs> I want to acknowledge we have never done this, okay? We, we have talked about matters which affect certain things that come up in the political sphere, and that is because they're in the Bible long before they happen to come up in our particular political sphere. But we have never engaged directly on a particular <coughs> issue or matter where, prior to this where we have told people how we think it is clear that they should view it. Um, but if you do the math in all of 2023, that puts us at about 0.15%. It's based on about 25 hours of collective direct uh, work per week across all our groups and all those kind of things. So that was meant to be somewhat funny, but you get the point. <laughs> We're nowhere near that, that number, which is, which is good. But there is another question. Should we really do it now? You know, um, What happened today, earlier today? We opened the doors to our building. A time when many would think that the best thing to do would be as non-controversial as one could possibly seem to be. Why would we not take that road in this particular matter? Because we can't. Okay? Because we can't. Because we live in a time and we live in a place where at this particular time, in this particular place, this has been brought before us, and what I mean by that is we live in a time where there has been a politicization of morals, and basically morals in the sense of what is right or wrong is now in our time political issues. And this comes from a number of, there are a number of reasons for this, but one of them is it used to be that you were considered someone but what you did wasn't what you are, it was what you did. And now we live in a time where what you do or what you think actually becomes your very source and identity. So emotions and psychology are what our world puts forward as what things are, and then those become political matters. And so we didn't put issue one on the ballot, um, not at all. And we didn't put anything like it on the ballot, but the reality is it is, and what the Bible says about how we should view these things is not affected, but clearly by a political matter before us. Um, also, uh, I think there is biblical clarity. Now, if you were here two weeks ago at David's FAQ, how many people were, were here for that? Good, that allows me to go faster in a couple places. But um, basically, in terms of what the Bible teaches, you cannot read scripture and not see that it comes down in favor of protecting life at every end of the spectrum, from the very beginning to the very moment when God calls a, a person home. And so because of that, there's biblical clarity on it, but it does raise another question, which is it voting a matter of conscience? I actually had, uh, we've had this discussion among church leadership, and I've had this discussion with people that, you know, isn't what you do when, I used to say go behind the curtain, but we don't really have that anymore, but press the button on the little electronic machine, or feed the thing at the end into the, in the little gauge, whatever that might be, um, isn't that a matter of conscience? What do you think? How many say yes? How many say no? How many say it depends? Always a good answer. Yeah. Okay, so, um, I'm teaching a class in a few weeks on Christian conscience, so this is like a 
500 mile an hour primer real quick uh, of what that means. But Christian conscience is your awareness or sense of what you believe is right or wrong at this point in time based on God's word as illuminated by the Holy Spirit. That's Christian conscience, not just any conscience. Okay, and our Westminster Confession of Faith says that God alone is the Lord of the conscience and that it should not be bound by the commandments of men. And so in many cases, that might answer the question that it is a matter of conscience, but when might it not? So um, a helpful thing that I do in that class, which we get to after a lot of thinking about these matters, but we're gonna jump straight there, is to look at levels of conscience issues. So if you were here for David's, he mentioned these briefly. Um, First level issues would be things that all Christians believe, teachings all Christians believe. Meaning, if you do not believe one of that category of things, you actually, whether you realize it or not, are not an orthodox Christian, meaning you don't believe the historical truths of the faith. What the gospel is, the Trinity, resurrection, and the return of Jesus, those are things that would fall into that category across all cultures and all times. A second level issue is probably bigger, I would say, which is teachings that all Christians should believe. Now, if someone comes to faith immediately, and they have, or, or from the moment, excuse me, that they come to faith, they don't immediately understand all that is in Scripture and all the ramifications of it within their lives. Why, why or how could they, right? And so they may not actually have a defined biblical position on a number of issues. Now, if they hold the, those unbiblical positions in the face of good teaching, but we have a word for that historically in the church, it's called heresy, right? But if they haven't been taught that yet, then they don't know that, but hopefully through the discipline of the church and everything else, they find out what those things are. So the authority that God has over our lives, what sin is in, in our lives, and that we are to obey God's command. Now, I would put it, God's teaching on the importance and sanctity of life, specifically the matter of abortion in that place. Because again, you cannot read scripture and think otherwise. But there are two other levels. Third level issues are reasonable theological differences. So um, I have baptism up there. Um, there might be some really good Baptists or recovering Baptists in the room or something <laughs> like that. You know, I'm a recovering attorney, you can be a recovering Baptist, that's fine. So we have very different views than Baptists do on baptism and that particular sacrament. I would not break fellowship with them or call them something other than a faithful follower of Jesus for that case, but that might be a reason that we're at different churches. Right? And then fourth level issues, disputable matters of conscience that would exist within a single congregation. So um, should we ever have alcohol? Would be an easy one for that, you know. Um, can you shop at or work at Victoria's Secret? Now they do nice things for women, right, I guess, but at the same time, maybe you have other thoughts on what they do for women and you have a very different view on that and Christians can come to different conclusions on those things. Can you teach in a public school versus a teacher that needs to go somewhere else? Like Christians will come to different views on these. That is fine, okay. So where is voting in this? I'll jump back and forth. Very quiet. Where is voting? Two. Okay. Let <clears throat> me say four. I think in most cases voting is four. In most cases, I think voting is four. Definitely in terms of candidates, and here's why. Here's why I would say that. Um, politics are a very mixed bag. Candidates. Candidates are mixed people. The reality is we pick the lesser of two evils until the day that Jesus returns. That is always the case until Christ is on the ballot, right? Can I get an amen for that? <laughs> yeah, so that is the case. So we look at all the things that a particular candidate stands for, or we might look at all the things that a particular piece of legislation has to say, and we might say that, well, on balance, I lean in this direction, and on balance, somebody else leans in another direction. I actually don't think that's the case on this particular matter. Because this is abortion on the ballot. And there's a lot of other things in here, which Craig is going to go through, but the reality is that is what the amendment is about, and it is about it to the hilt. In which case, I would say it's a second level issue. So the point of this is to persuade you of that. There's also widespread confusion on what it actually is on the ballot. 
Has anyone ever heard of the law of non-contradiction? Yeah? Okay, so contradictory propositions cannot both be true at the same time in the same sense. That means if I tell you that I'm holding out my hand with my palm down in front of me, that's either true at this moment in time or it isn't, right? And now it changes when I go here. There are obviously some truths that it doesn't change for. But two things that are opposite propositions can't be true in the same sense at the same time. They're opposed to each other. Everybody follow me? That's a philosophical principle. Okay, so read these. This is from Ohioans United for Reproductive Rights. Issue one allows for reasonable limits on abortion after fetal viability with protections and regulations to ensure the health and safety of patients. Or from the Center of Christian Virtue, issue one allows for a child to be aborted through all nine months of pregnancy. One of them has to be true, or maybe they could both be wrong, but they can't both be true. You know, this happens to some extent a lot in politics, but it's, I think, particularly egregious in this particular moment that we find ourselves. Here's two more. Ohio law requires young people to get parental consent before getting an abortion or any medical procedure, and issue one does not change that. As opposed to passing issue one means abortion clinics could perform abortions on a minor without their parents' knowledge or permission. Is it true or it isn't? And so we're here to talk about what is. The last reason we're doing this, or another reason we're doing this, is if not the church, then who? Um, this is, what I'm, what I'm about to put up, I, I think it's kind of scary. Um, a recent poll by Baldwin Wallace University in the state of Ohio, I think conducted at the very beginning of October, showed that here is the breakdown across a bunch of self-identified groupings of those who plan to vote yes on issue one. 89% of Democrats, 39% of Republicans, 51% of independents, 65% of parents. Now that's interesting. They must have a particular view on which of those two things is true on one of the screens that, that I just showed you. 54% of gun owners, now I don't, I don't know that there's any direct correlation on this matter. <laughs> that was in their study. But I, but I would say that politically speaking, and I'm open to correction on this, um, those who are socially conservative tend to be gun owners, and those who are socially conservative tend to be um, pro-life people. So there does tend to be some crossover that's pretty heavy across those two groups. And here, 54% of gun owners are going to vote yes. And the last one, 37% of people self-identifying as evangelical Christians. Now, we don't know who they are. And we don't know if they actually are, are believers. We don't know anything about them, but the reality is if they self-identify that way, they purport to know something about it. And that is over a third, nearly 40% that feel that way. Here's the last reason that we're doing this. Um, I kind of alluded to this at the beginning, but we believe that there's a pastoral responsibility. Here's a quote from Martin Luther as we approach the time of the Reformation, which you may be familiar with, if you preach the gospel in all aspects, with the exception of the issues which deal specifically with your time, you are not preaching the gospel at all. Can I get an amen? Amen. The point of preaching the gospel, the point of teaching what God's word says and the truth of it, is so that we can apply it to live, move, and act, and engage in this world. That is the reason for it. And so, you know, we could stay silent on something like this, but is that really the right thing to do given the time that we find ourselves in? I think it isn't. So um, that's enough for me. And now, Greg is going to come up and he's going to start with looking at the current state of the law. How it is that we got here today? And I'm going to try really hard not to read, but I want to get very technical with everybody because this is contextual, very important. I'm going to read quite a few quotes, um, starting from Judge Alito's uh, decision in the Dobbs case. So how did we get here today? Um, everybody is aware, I assume, in this room of the at first leaked Dobbs decision, which came out last June. Um, came out on June 22nd of last year. And that was the United States Supreme Court decision and the landmark decision of Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization in which the United States Supreme Court held that the Constitution of the United States does not confer a federal constitutional right of abortion in the U.S. 
Um, briefly, the Dobbs case was concerned with the constitutionality of a 2018 Mississippi state law, which banned most abortion operations after the first 15 weeks of gestation. The Mississippi law was based on a model by the Christian legal organization Alliance Defending Freedom, and it was designed with the specific intent to promote the legal battle. Uh, that would eventually reach the Supreme Court and would result in the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Uh, in the Dobbs case, the Jackson Women's Health Organization, which was Mississippi's only abortion clinic at the time, uh, sued Thomas Dobbs, who was simply a state health officer with the Mississippi Department of Health. In that case, the lower courts issued injunctions preventing that new law from being enforced. The injunction was based on the United States Supreme Court's decisions in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, which was in 1992, which followed Roe by obviously almost 20 years, which had prevented states from banning abortions before fetal viability, which means that um, when a fetus can potentially live outside of the womb on its own. Uh, historically, in both Roe and Casey, the Supreme Court practicing medicine from the bench decided that viability was at 24 weeks. And so this statute was intentionally provocative to shorten that period by nine months. And it succeeded because the, the uh, United States Supreme Court took it. Uh, on June of last year and June 22nd, the Supreme Court issued its Dobbs decision. Um, let's see. That is just the majority opinion of it. There were uh, one concurrence and three dissents. It's 229 pages total. Um, I actually would recommend that you read it if you're interested in the history of abortion in the United States. Um, 229 pages of small type is a small book. Um, it'll take you a day or so to get through it. Um, it's probably well worth it to fully understand what's happening in this country right now. Uh, in the Dobbs decision, which was authored by Justice Alito, it was a six to three decision, uh, it reversed the lower court's rulings that the injunction would stand. Uh, in so doing, the majority held that abortion, again, is not a federal constitutional right, as the Constitution, our Constitution, does not mention abortion at all. And the alleged Roe versus Casey substantive right of abortion uh, was not what the court said, it was not deeply rooted in the country's history, which is the requirement. Uh, they thus overturned Roe and Casey, and they returned the decisions regarding abortion regulation completely back to the states, completely. Um, importantly, and for context of what the United States Supreme Court did, what Justice Alito actually did, I want to read to you some quotes of his in reaching his decision um, which I think are very important to understand why we're sitting here today. Um, the first quote, look at I made it as big as I could, but it was up to the same. Well, I'm going to read them. You can read them yourselves. But I, for context, listen to what Justice Alito was saying. Uh, the first quote is, ordered liberally, liberty sets the limits and defines the boundaries between competing interests. Roe and Casey each struck a particular balance between the interests of a woman who wants an abortion and the interests of what they termed potential life. But the people of various states may evaluate those interests differently. In some states, voters may believe that an abortion right should be even more extensive than Roe and Casey recognized. Voters in other states may wish to impose tight restrictions based on the belief that the abortion destroys an unborn human being, which would be us. Our nation's historical understanding of ordered liberty does not prevent the people's elected representatives from deciding how abortion should be regulated. Um, the next quote. The contending sides in this case make impassioned and conflicting arguments about the effects of the abortion right on the lives of women. The contending sides also make conflicting arguments about the status of a fetus. This court has never has neither the authority nor the expertise to adjudicate those disputes. And the Casey plurality speculations and weighing of the relative importance of the fetus and the mother represent a departure from the original constitutional proposition that courts 
courts do not substitute their social and economic beliefs for the judgment of legislative bodies. Uh, the third quote I want to share with you starts as follows. <clears throat> Our decision returns the issue of abortion to those legislative bodies, those being states. And it allows women on both sides of the abortion issue to seek to affect the legislative process by influencing public opinion, lobbying legislators, voting, and running office, running for office. Women are not without electoral or political power. It is thus clear now, post, post Dobbs, that the issue of abortion is squarely, if not completely, I will argue it is completely, in the hands of the people of the states now. Um, that is why the proponents of issue one, the proposed constitutional amendment, seek to portray it as a reasonable, we the people response to the Dobbs invitation for state level abortion laws. And let me stop there for a second. When I say invitation, in his opinion, before Judge Alito got to these quotes, um, he, he made several references to the fact in holding that abortion was not deeply rooted in the United States to the fact that none of the states had abortion in their constitutions. Guess what the ACLU picked up on from that statement with Planned Parenthood. So that's where we're at now. Now we have a group of people that are not Ohioans who have put, who have managed to get this ballot proposition on the ballot in November, and they're simply doing basically what, what we asked for, or what was asked for. I had originally, um, and I had to take it out of my original outline, I was gonna call this uh, the beheading, then be careful what you wish for. You know, everybody wanted Robert Casey overruled. Well, we're overruled, so here we are. Uh, the next thing I want to talk to you is about the strategy. Uh, this is not coincidental that this is going on in Ohio. Um, after Dobbs, several states immediately introduced abortion restrictions and revived old abortion laws that were dormant under Roe and Casey. As of 2023, abortion is heavily restricted in 17 states. However, referendums, or referenda, taken directly to the voters, which bypass state legislatures, uh, have, conducted, have been conducted in the wake of Dobbs, and decisions in Kansas, Montana, California, Vermont, Michigan, and Kentucky have all uniformly come out in favor of abortion rights, often by bipartisan majorities, and with overwhelming margins. Uh, these several, several referenda are highly coordinated and they are not at all coincidental. In the 16 months since the Dobbs decision has come out, the abortion industry has focused on one particular strategy and one strategy alone for promoting abortion and protecting its bottom line and that is amending state constitutions as they were invited to do so by Judge Alito. Um, these state constitutional amendment campaigns are designed to look as though that they are grassroots efforts. At first glance, groups led with the names like Ohioans for reproductive rights, Floridians protecting freedom, uh, New Yorkers for equal rights appear to be campaigns spearheaded by local citizens. They are not. Uh, behind the facade, the campaign these campaigns are part of a larger targeted effort driven by the abortion industry stalwarts such as Planned Parenthood, NARAL, which is the National Association for the Repeal of Abortion Laws, which is about to change its name again because everybody now knows what NARAL is. <laughs> so they're going to be called Reproductive Freedom for All. And the ACLU, that's who's behind these efforts. Uh, the language of reproductive rights or freedom or equal rights is itself misleading because it aims to place abortion alongside things like access to mischarge treatment and others. It's misleading. Uh, simply put, pro-abortion laws confer, confer only a special right to take a life under this disguised language of liberty. Using such language in state constitutional amendments, the abortion industry looks to solidify abortion in each of our states. Constitutional amendments are far more difficult to reverse than laws, which can be changed with each legislative session. 
And in many cases, these amendments will undo pro-life protections or abortion restrictions currently in place and passed by our elected lawmakers. This pro-abortion strategy has taken hold in a number of states, and I want to tell you about a couple of them particularly, just for your context, that this is not coincidental. Uh, last November, November 22, Vermont became the first state to enshrine the right of abortion in its constitution via something known as Article 22, which was captioned or titled Reproductive Liberty Amendment. Uh, the abortion industry, including Planned Parenthood and the ACLU, actively campaigned for that constitutional amendment, despite the fact that Vermont is actually considered a fairly abortion-friendly state to begin with. At that time, a woman named Lucy Lerich, that's L-E-R-I-C-H-E, who was the Vice President of the Vermont Public Policy at Planned Parenthood uh, office in Northern New England, revealed specifically that the Constitutional Amendment campaigns, her work nationally, would be an abortion industry strategy when she told the Washington Post that Vermont was intended to be a model for the rest of the country. She said, and I quote, in states all over the country, politicians are willing to take away reproductive rights, specifically abortion rights, and we could be an example of another way. California, surprisingly, quickly followed Vermont with the passage of Proposition 1, which amended the state constitution to prohibit the state from interfering with or denying an individual's reproductive freedom, which is defined to include a right to an abortion and a right to contraceptives. <coughs> Again, Planned Parenthood indicated that pushing California, where pro-abortion victory was relatively easy to secure, was part of a larger strategy, and I will quote, we know other states are looking at California, and it's why we worked so hard to send that message and not just narrowly pass this, but overwhelmingly pass this initiative. And that is a quote from Jody Hicks, the president and CEO of Planned Parenthood Affiliates of California. Uh, closer to home, right next door, Michigan did take a look at California and passed its constitutional amendment, Proposition 3, last year after raking in tens of millions of dollars from abortion backers. Uh, the amendment was heavily promoted by a political action committee called Reproductive Freedom for All, led by the ACLU of Michigan, Michigan Voices, and Planned Parent Advocates of Michigan. Michigan was the first state that pushed the constitutional amendment where victory wasn't guaranteed. So Michigan was something of a test case. It's a so-called purple state. Um, there was never really a question in the liberal states like Vermont and California that they would pass these measures. It was less certain in Michigan, so it's very significant for us as they're moving eastward across the country. Um, there were some unique elements that were at play in Michigan. For one, after Roe was overturned, the then Republican-led <coughs> legislature in Michigan opted to let a decades-old abortion trigger law come into effect, and that law eliminated nearly all abortions. Um, as or more importantly, the legislature, legislators there made absolutely no effort to offer any alternatives or to massage the language of that legislation uh, to make it perhaps more palatable. Um, that made Michigan voters all that much more receptive to the amendment because it had no exceptions in it and took the fairly innocuous sounding language of their constitutional amendment um, into play. Uh, the reality in Michigan, however, is that our amendment went, meant, went, went much further than that, than what it uh, was intended to do, and has opened the door to strict existing provisions such as requiring parental consent for minors in Michigan. And uh, don't be fooled um, by anybody telling you the opposite in an article that the ACLU of Michigan posts on their own website dated July 26th, this summer, 2023. Uh, unashamedly says to remove the burdens placed on young people who need access to reproductive health care, we must repeal Michigan's outdated parental consent law. 
don't be fooled. That's what the ACLU and Planned Parenthood want to do in Ohio. They say it, they don't hide it. The strategy in Ohio, the continuing strategy in Ohio, those groups which backed the successful constitutional amendment in Michigan are hoping to achieve the same outcome here in Ohio and the political climate here may actually aid them in their cause, much like it did in Michigan, so we probably should have learned a lesson from what happened in Michigan. And here's that climate here in Ohio. Ohio's heartbeat bill was first proposed, believe it or not, way back in 2011, and it was finally signed into law in 2019 with the strong support of Ohio. Preemption applies regardless of whether conflicting laws come from legislatures, courts, administrative agencies, or constitutions. Thus in Ohio, the Ohio, the Ohio Constitution wins, so to speak, over state legislation and the U.S. Supreme Court. Constitutional law wins over the Ohio Constitution and Ohio Constitutional jurisprudence on constitutional issues. In Ohio, citizens, the people, have two options for taking matters into their own hands and for proposing policy changes through a ballot initiative they can offer a statute, which they would have drafted, which changes the law under the Ohio Revised Code, which is our set of written laws in Ohio, uh, or you can do it by way of a constitutional amendment, which of course amends the Ohio Constitution. Uh, usually, and if voters want to uh, affect policy change, uh, they should attempt to initiate a statute to change the law instead of adding an amendment to the Ohio Constitution. Uh, the counter argument to that obviously goes that uh, an Ohio law offers no protection for a newly passed statute. Uh, in that regard, lawmakers can immediately repeal or modify whatever changes voters approve in a statute. And that is why, as the argument goes, the Ohio Constitution is often the last best refuge for voters, especially on fundamental issues such as democracy, civil rights, and human rights. Uh, that's why issue number one came into being in Ohio and is so important to the amendment's sponsors. Uh, I'm going to digress for a second, and um, I'm going to ask you some questions that could be rhetorical. Nobody has the answers. Um, but I'm curious if anybody knows how many uh, suggested amendments have been suggested to the United States Constitution in the 234 years it's been in existence. Anybody want to throw out a guess? 100. 100. 33, 33 total in 234 years. Uh, here's, a, here's a civics quiz. Uh, does anybody know how many constitutional amendments we actually have under the federal constitution? It's 27. So 27 times the constitution has been amended in 234 years. Uh, does anyone here know how, a, how, how you get a citizen-led initiative in front of the voters to change the Ohio Constitution. It, it, it's not very hard, um, I'll tell you. In order to get a citizen-led initiative on the ballot to amend Ohio's Constitution, one, the percentage of the state voters who would have to vote yes is only 50% plus one. It is a simple majority, that's it. Uh, the petition for signatures, uh, which must be obtained, must be obtained from at least 44 of the 88 counties in Ohio, or only half of them. Uh, three from each of those 44 counties canvassed, and they get canvassed. Uh, there must be signatures equal to at least 5% of the total vote cast for the office of governor in that county at the last gubernatorial election. Um, that's not very hard to do. Would anyone like to guess how many voter initiatives to amend Ohio's constitution have been made in just the last 15 years? And David almost guessed this on, on Wednesday, so you can't answer. I mean, the last 15 years, how many efforts do you think people have made to try to change the constitution? 51. 51 tries. Um, six ballot initiatives have gotten on the ballot, three have been passed in that time. If you do the quick math, that's one voter successful initiated constitutional amendment every five years. 
We change our constitution all the time here in Ohio. Uh, does anybody have a distinct recollection of Ohioans actually wanting casino gambling here in 2009? Yes. Uh, I, you know, I don't, or do you just recall Penn, Penn Ventures LLC and Rock Ohio Ventures LLC, two Pennsylvania companies owned by Dan Gilbert, who owns the Cavaliers, mm -hmm. dumped in $50 million in Ohio to get the, that passed. Um, does anybody realize that out of state proponents of any such initiative can actually pick and choose which counties they go into for signatures? They're ignoring all of our rural counties, mm -hmm. our conservative rural counties. They don't have to go there. It's just 44. They can pick them. The fact of the matter is that it's, it's simply not that hard for outsiders. I mean, rank outsiders, not Ohio, to influence policy in Ohio by bypassing our legislature and taking issues directly to the intelligentsia. And that's exactly what the youth ACLU and Planned Parenthood are doing in Ohio right now. Uh, we lost in August. We can't afford to lose again mm -hmm. in November. Uh, simply put, laws, statutes, get vetted, they get debated, and they get voted on by our duly elected legislators who at least in theory, our experts on enacting laws. Um, usually those debates and votes occur over, many times over, over periods of months before the legislation is passed. Here, Ohio voters are being asked to vote on a dangerous constitutional amendment on a take it or leave it basis with almost no real discussion at all. Well, does that make any sense to anybody? But that's where we're at. Um, moving on, let's get to the meat of the matter. What does this thing say? And what does it say? Uh, the amendment itself is short. I think that David's that big view, there may have been a handout of it. It's one page, basically. There are several good resources on the internet. We have back here, too. Oh, you were just back there. They're on the back of the uh, if anybody wants to grab it, uh, there's, there's one that's back there, which is a very good resource, and I can't remember the, uh, the committee that prepared it, but it basically, if you look at them side by side, everybody turn around really quickly. <laughs> if you pick up the amendment itself, there's a clean one back there, and then there's one that marks it up. It kind of points to everything I'm about, about to talk to you about for the next 15 minutes in a very easy to understand illustrative way. Um, so again, the amendment itself is very short. Yeah. Uh, it's full text. Again, you, you can get in the back of the room. It provides very little in the way of definitions, which is purposeful. Many of the descriptive terms in it, uh, from the title to the text, are undefined, leaving voters to make assumptions regarding their meaning and scope. Um, the first concern with the amendment starts with its very confusing title and the extra protections it supposedly is providing for those people or not. The terms reproductive freedom and protections for health and safety are largely left undefined and are inten intentionally vague. Uh, they do not fairly represent the breadth of the changes that would result here in Ohio with the passage of issue one. Also, the amendment begins by creating an Ohio constitutional right to four things that no one wants to make illegal in the first place, uh, before even mentioning the four. And those being one, contraception, two, fertility treatment, three, continuing one's own pregnancy, and four, miscarriage care. Does anyone really question that Ohioans aren't already entitled to all of those? The United States Supreme Court, certainly doesn't have a problem with those. Um, every Ohioan already has access to quality maternal care. In some cases, it's provided for free. Uh, additionally, it's, it's important for us to stress that miscarriage and abortion are two entirely separate things, uh, both morally and when it comes to their medical care. Uh, miscarriage is an unintended, heartbreaking, painful loss. Abortion is something entirely different. Uh, this smoke screen, this smoke screen is thus a clear, intentional misdirection. Uh, to take the, vo the voters, your neighbors, proverbial eye off the ball of what the amendment is precisely otherwise about, which is unfettered and unrestricted abortion on demand for everyone. 
as we will see as we continue. Um, the next concern with the amendment is that it creates what's called fundamental rights. Um, the text of the amendment would insert into Article I of the Ohio Constitution, which is our Bill of Rights, um, this fundamental right to reproductive freedom. Uh, however, the voters are not informed of the meaning or the import of what a fundamental right is in Ohio, which have traditionally included rights reflected in the United States Constitution and its Bill of Rights, such as freedom of speech and right to a trial by jury. For instance, of huge consequence with respect to the potential fundamental right of abortion in Ohio, Justice Alito, in his Dobbs opinion, held that any challenge to any Ohio state legislation or to any state constitutional amendment will be based on what's called the rational basis test in the United States Supreme Court juris jurisprudence. And all that means is that if the Ohio voters uh, had any rational basis on which they could have thought that this constitutional amendment serves a legitimate state interest, and what they will say is they're protecting maternal, physical, and mental and emotional safety. Uh, it must be upheld. Um, that's the standard that Justice Alito said in Dobbs. That's what we have to live with. That's a far cry from strict scrutiny under Roe versus Wade or undue burden on your case. I mean, it just has to be rational. That's it. Um, that's our new test. Under the rational basis test historically in United States Supreme Court jur jurisprudence, of what that means is that either our uh, Ohio Supreme Court or the U.S. Supreme Court itself cannot, one, substitute its own social and economic beliefs for the judgment of the legislative bodies. In this case, it will be for us voters. They cannot deny uh, respect for a legislator's judgment, even when the law at issue concerned matters of great social significance and moral substitute, substance. They can't, they can't touch it or address it. And three, like other health and welfare laws, they cannot deny a strong presumption of validity to legislative action in those areas. Um, without getting into too complicated a legal discussion about this, rather, rational basis on its face is obviously far less a far lesser standard than the protections commonly given under strict scrutiny in the pre-Dobbs uh, cases. Um, it's not, therefore, accurate for the proponents of this amendment to claim that it simply resurrects and codifies Roe versus Wade. It doesn't. It instead goes dangerously beyond Roe. And this proposed constitutional amendment will be very, very difficult to be challenged, much less ever over return. And in that regard, section three of the amendment states that abortion may, not must, may be prohibited after fetal viability. But in no case may such, abort, such an abortion be prohibited if the professional judgment of the pregnant patient's treating physician in the professional judgment of the pregnant patient's treating physician it is necessary to protect the pregnant patient's life or health. Um, this unlimited health exception will be used by those opposed to any restrictions or regulations on abortions to rubber stamp unnecessary, dangerous, and inhumane late-term abortions, period. Uh, courts are likely to find the word health as the same meaning as under the United States Con uh, United States Supreme Court's Roe precedents, and specifically there's a case called Doe versus Alton, where the United States Supreme Court held that health includes, quote, all factors, physical, emotional, psychological, familial, and the woman's age rel relevant to the well-being of the patient. That's all health. Uh, for example, a woman who claims that her family dynamic would be upset if she decided to uh, have this baby, that would qualify as a familial health exception. And the abortion could go forward. Um, moreover, it's the pregnant patient's physician who determines solely in his or her judgment if the mother's emotional and familial health is at risk. Um, and who is that pregnant patient's treating physician? Well, it's, it's the doctor who's performing the abortion, who has many incentives, financial and otherwise, to render such judgment. So this is, in my opinion, and many others, completely illusory. Um, and then also, 
also has no guardrails whatsoever uh, to assess when, when a post-viability abortion is necessary. Um, the, the language of the amendment leads into the determination again to the individual's physician, again, the abortion provider, uh, his or her professional judgment um, whether or not this uh, abortion is necessary or could be necessary. Um, professional judgment isn't defined or qualified and is thus subject to abuse by doctors who oppose any limitations on abortion. Um, professional judgment can mean anything, uh, and it can differ quite greatly between physicians. Um, Ohio officials, including the Medical Licensing Board, um, have no objective standards by which to judge a physician's actions, uh, which places patients at risk and leaves physicians themselves without any meaningful guidance in Ohio. Um, other states have wisely implemented stronger language to prevent abuse of the necessity exception. Um, some require a reasonable medical judgment. Um, the most common standard employed, employed by other states um, state that, and this will be a quote, um, reasonable. Medical judgment that would be made by a reasonably prudent physician knowledgeable about the case and the treatment possibilities with respect to the medical conditions involved. Um, even states like California employ this lesser good faith medical judgment standard in their state abortion related statutes, but Ohio's proposed amendment, issue one, includes none of those limitations on the physician's decision making and leaves the door wide open for abuse of this exception. Um, further, the amendment's definition of fetal viability is simply medically inaccurate. Um, section four defines fetal viability as the point of pregnancy when, in the professional judgment of the pregnant patient's treating physician, the fetus has a significant likelihood of survival outside the years with reasonable measures. This is determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, I would argue that this definition could callously endanger many preterm infants who would otherwise survive after birth. Uh, the vast majority of abortion-related state laws elsewhere use a medically appropriate definition of viability, such as, and I'll quote, that stage of fetal development when in the judgment of the physician based on the particular facts of the case before him or her and in light of the most advanced medical technology and information available to him or her, there is a reasonable likelihood of sustained survival of the unborn child outside the body of the mother with or without artificial support. That's what most other states say. The proposed amendment here in Ohio requires a significant likelihood of sustained survival, not a reasonable um, likelihood of sustained survival, while the correct definition, again, would require reasonable likelihood. Um, how will significant likelihood of sustained survival be determined by somebody? Uh, how many babies will be denied a chance at life under that provision? Um, we don't know, and neither do the rest of the Ohio voters who are voting on this in November, who will be asked to approve this medically inappropriate and dubious standard. Um, the amendment's definition of viability also could be interpreted to preclude the application of extraordinary measures, while the medically correct definition includes application of artificial support. Most of the other states say viability includes being put on life-sustaining uh, treatments. Uh, again, how will reasonable measures be defined? Um, what medical measures are contemplated by this language? How many babies who would otherwise have a chance of survival will instead be aborted because the care required would be considered unreasonable? How much care is reasonable when it comes to preserving the life of a preborn child? No one knows, especially not the voters. Um, in addition, the amendment will probably probably force Ohio taxpayers to fund abortion and contraception and fertility treatments and more. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court and federal law prohibits federal taxpayer dollars from funding abortions right now. Strong majorities of, of taxpayers agree that tax dollars should not be used to pay for abortion. Yet under this amendment, Ohio taxpayer dollars could be required to do so. And here's why. 
similar language in other state laws has, has been construed by courts to require the government to pay for abortion services. And since Ohio does fund some types of health care, it could also have to find reproductive health care, including abortion procedures and providers under the amendment. And this is because the amendment prohibits the state and its subdivisions from directly or indirectly doing anything that would burden or penalize or interfere with or discriminate against the individual's superior right. Um, the state may be held in violation of this unless us Ohio taxpayers fund the abortion. Uh, Ohioans could be forced to pay for these procedures and products for residents and non-residents, minors and adults, males and females. Uh, Ohio will join California, New York, and Minnesota as, in my opinion, the most dangerous, unregulated, and unrestricted wild west for abortions to the detriment of our women, infants, and Ohio taxpayers. Um, next, the amendment arguably, and I'm going to say arguably if there are any physicians or medical care providers in the room, it arguably threatens their freedom of conscience to make decisions, medical decisions. Under the amendment, laws protecting the freedom of conscience of healthcare professionals and permitting them to opt out of performing or participating in abortions and other objectionable procedures could be seen as a burden or as an interference on the individual's superior fundamental right to reproductive freedom. <clears throat> While the paramount of importance of freedom of conscience has always been repeatedly affirmed by the United States Supreme Court in this battle of rights here in Ohio, freedom of conscience may be deemed subservient to the newly created fundamental right of reproductive freedom under this proposed constitutional amendment. This threat to freedom of medical conscience is absolutely untenable, uh, and it could lead to more nurses, doctors, and medical professionals leaving the medical field altogether rather than having their consciences violated. Um, finally, the amendment ignores legitimate state interests. Um, as we saw from Justice Alito's quotes, um, traditionally there are competing interests. So the mothers have interests, the state has interests. Um, as the United States Supreme Court has recognized, uh, and this will be a quote, uh, these legitimate interests of the state include respect for and preservation of prenatal life at all stages of development, the protection of maternal health and safety, <coughs> the elimination of particularly gruesome or barbaric procedures for preservation of the integrity of the medical profession. Um, arguably, all of those issues will uh, be compromised if this constitutional amendment is passed. Um, finally, uh, my closing thoughts. Uh, what I'm saying to you is not Frank Mellick hyperbole. Uh, I, I researched this fairly carefully and if you go on the internet, um, many other people um, share these views. Um, perhaps your neighbors, um, certainly the media here in Ohio, and certainly the special interests who are infiltrating Ohio and that have sponsored and push issue one to a vote will tell you that everything I've just discussed with you is extremist hyperbole. It absolutely is not. Um, but you don't have to take my word for it. Um, the Ohio Attorney General David Yost has posted on his website a position paper that I purposefully have neither parroted here, Stephanie, nor quoted at all. Um, because you can all read it, and I encourage you to read it yourselves. It is an excellent and chilling analysis of this amendment, coming from the proverbial top cop in Ohio. As you'll see if you read it, Attorney General Yost holds virtually the same dire views of the amendment that I've just described. The fact that he felt compelled to officially create and post his office's analysis on the record weeks prior to a vote is telling, in my opinion. Uh, in case you have not seen them, Governor DeWine and his wife Fran are also all over the media and social media, urging Ohioans to vote issue one down. And this is not because they're Republicans. This is because they believe in a society, societal evil uh, which is going to be allowed for abortion on demand if this is passed. Um, so don't be mistaken. This, this amendment is far-reaching, serious, serious, serious matter, and it must be stopped for all of the reasons I just said. Okay. Very quickly, and then we're going to
going to go to a Q&A. A, a couple of things on, on cultural impl implications of, of all of this. Um, <coughs> the reality is that whatever the controversy or the issue is of the day shapes the culture of tomorrow. And sometimes today and tomorrow aren't really that far apart. And so I want to I just want to comment on a few of them. The, the first is that legalization leads inevitably to normalization. Um, to, to Greg's point on, on gambling, when you make some, when you decriminalize or you allow something, um, it over time changes views on it, sometimes very quickly. Uh, that the society shifts to a cultural viewpoint that the thing just isn't really that bad because it's legal. You know? um, Issue two, which we're not going to talk about today, would be a good example of how that we will all see very rapidly if it does pass, happen. And so the, the cultural mindset of those things shifts on that. And I, I think another one is, um, uh, and I'm going to get to this from a biblical perspective in a minute, but um, what, what makes human society function um, is that looking to future generations, caring for it and protecting them and giving them the best society that we can possibly give is what makes society move forward. And the reality is this is a now shift away from a then in the future attitude. Do you, do you see what I mean by that? It is whatever the, whatever the existing circumstance might be, we're trying to cover by this as opposed to thinking through all of the potential ramifications for uh, the next generation. It also, it elevates emotional thinking and identity above physical uh, reality. As Greg um, pointed out, um, it continues the shift that is already going on in our culture where because health is undefined in the, in the amendment, um, health explodes to a lot of things that actually swallow up what we traditionally would think of as matters of health. And so what is the health from a physical perspective actually takes a back seat to what might be the extrapolated view of health in, in other cases. Um, another one relates to pregnancy centers. And if you were here at the last FAQ, um, Kathy Scanlon for PHC talked a little bit about um, how dire this potentially could be uh, for them. Um, I think it's at least that, that bad, and here's, here's why I think that from a cultural perspective. If you look at the language um, and then what the implications will be of it, where it says that the, the state cannot directly or indirectly, and then has a whole list of things that cannot be done, and then at the bottom it, of course, defines what a state actor actually is. And one of those things is discriminate, okay? So in the case of, of discrimination, well, what would it mean to discriminate? Well, it could mean any number of things. And in our, our particular culture, one of the great ways that people think discrimination happens is that money goes to something versus going to something else, that you support one thing with funding and you don't support another, um, that you have a process of, of directing people in a particular place or in a particular way versus another. And the entire concept of pregnancy health centers is basically based on that. You heard Kathy say that the amount or the likelihood of an abortion drops, I think, like four or five fold if they do an ultrasound. You know? And so if the government can't fund these tiny little pregnancy centers, which PDHC is a, is a much larger one, of course, but think about a rural county somewhere that just has a small pregnancy center. And if it can't rely on any type of funding, because to do so would be discriminatory, then the society ends up, the government ends up going one way or the other. Either you, either you go ahead and fund both the pregnancy center and the abortion and further move the culture toward the normalization of that, or you fund neither. It can also have an impact on public school teachers and counselors, and this can change the tenor of those conversations. Imagine. If a 15-year-old walks into a school counselor's office and says, this is my situation, cannot indirectly or directly or indirectly cause any burden, interference, or discrimination of any kind, can they hand them a pamphlet to a pregnancy center? I, I, I don't know. And I, and I actually talked to a couple lawyer friends of mine and, 
and I also spoke with, um, when, when the governor's chief of staff spoke on this, she said that the, the reality is when the lawyer for the school system hears of that situation, they will say that the path of least resistance to avoid any lawsuit is all of the things that mitigate against or counsel against abortion get shoved out of the way. So be it pamphlets, be it recommendations, be it any of those things. And that is a shift from what we might think of as a balanced culture that we live in today, where you could put multiple options up in front of the person, if not the one that you choose, but it would be a very different one and I already commented on on government funding. And so the way I want to close with this is what does all this mean for us as, as believers? Well, we aren't supposed to be in this world, but not of the world. Everybody understands that concept as a Christian. But what does that mean when it comes to, we have, we have this on the ballot in front of us. How should we think about all of what was already said today? Well, First of all, we have to have the right enemy in our sights, Ephesians 6, 12. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. I think in most cases, because most Ohio voters um, may think that they are doing one thing and supporting issue one when actually a different result is going on, we should not vilify them. We do not do ourselves any favors for, for doing any of that. We should recognize that this is true, that even those who are in favor of it bear the image of God. Remember, we're doing this because we believe that all people that are created bear the image of God, as it says in Genesis. But it also says, right after that, that we have a creation mandate. God bless them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply Fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the ship, the sea, the birds of the heavens, over every living thing that moves on the earth. We live in a time and in a culture right now where we have moved away from uh, what would be called Christendom, like a Christian culture where whether people are Christians or not, Christian morality is the norm. Remember how I said earlier, like you used to be defined when you did things that were considered immoral, it was something you did, it was not something that you are. And now it's something that you actually are because everything is shifting away from that. So we live in a time which the Bible, I think, has a model for this for us. Does anybody know what that model be? Exile. We live in a particular time where we are strangers in a strange land. And the land is getting stranger all the time. That is a different culture that we find ourselves in. And this is what God says we are to do when we live in a time of exile. This was to the Jews who were in Babylonian exile. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their fruits, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. If we truly care about the world that we live in, then we do a number of things, but one of them is we engage in that world. We don't back down, we don't decide to batten down the hatches and just wait for Jesus to return if he decides to tarry, but we actually engage because God gave a creation mandate that we would help the world to flourish that, it is, that he has created. And the way that we do that, well, this is one way that we do that, is we speak on these things when we see evil at the gates. Why? Because we're supposed to love the people whether they love us or not. We're supposed to love them whether they have completely different views or not, than us or not, and we're supposed to seek the welfare of the city. And the way that we can do that here, I think, has already been made as clear as we can make it. Um, we now are going to shift to Q&A um, because it's supposed to be from 2 to 4. We'll end whenever we, we can end, but Greg and I both are happy to take questions anytime up until that point. So are there any questions or any topics related to this that, that people would like to raise or some clarity on that? Greg, come on back up here. 
Generally speaking, I scan the news pretty much every day, and I have yet to see any comment about it anywhere. Um, it, it's, it's on their website, and he, I knew about it because David and Ken had an audience with the governor who referenced it. Otherwise, I might not know about it. The only time I've seen it in an article is 171 Passage from, I believe, 23 counties in Ohio just recently penned like an open letter to the voters um, about voting down this issue. And they quote um, Attorney General Yost's memorandum at, at great length uh, for many issues, some of which I didn't speak about. But you can find it on his website, it's right there. I know, I mean, we still have to go hunt. You do for the website. I'm only just wondering if there's it appears in any public uh, yeah, document yeah. like I have the Columbus Dispatch, so that, for instance. Main Street Media does not want yeah. to promote it, so they will hide it all. I have not seen it anywhere except on the website. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and again, just in that one article, and um, I believe that letter was just written last week. And so, no, you wouldn't know about it. If, quite frankly, if David and Ken hadn't told me about it. The next question is, you have, you have to know where the websites are to look for. <laughs> you, you really do, and I mean, if you Google if ACLU, Ohio, abortion, amendment, transgenderism, it will, you wouldn't find something that's relevant probably until about your fifth or sixth page, and then you finally see it down there. They're doing a very good job of obfuscation and hiding. First of all, thanks, Greg. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in the beginning, you had a series of statements that were contradicting each other. Does that, is there any room for you know, legal action that can be taken that is you know, risk misrepresenting the facts? Like the legal legal action taken that that's that's not true, and so it's therefore misleading the public against those organizations that are doing so. Well, for what I what I believe the ACLU would term this to be is this is political speech, and there are no rules when it comes to this political speech. They can hide whatever they want. As Pastor David raised, those ads that are on TV right now don't talk about the fact that the heartbeat bill has been stated. Those ads are talking about the heartbeat bill. They are not talking about the existing abortion legislation in Ohio. And so they're scaring people, and that is flat out misinformation. Well, Greg, if you talk, like, so the, the contradictory statements, is that in the actual bill? No, it's about, it's about the bill. Thank you. Right. I think that's, so, that's to your um, point, yeah. Jeff. So it's a, yeah. it's right. It's a political ad mm -hmm. that takes a particular position on the bill, and they would defend it in, in those cases in two ways. The one about parental rights, they would say what they said, which is we have an Ohio parental rights law. Okay. And it doesn't say anything directly about parental rights in this bill. That is true and heavily misleading because of what it is and isn't in the bill and using terms like individual instead of woman and things of that nature. Or, They'll say it does allow for exceptions after viability and restrictions after viability. It even says it. Look at look at the bill. It says it. All that is true in that case. But again, if those exceptions don't amount to anything because the exception to the exception swallows it up, which is the case, then that's what we are saying of why it would be a lie. And so. Um, I don't know. To quote George Costanza, it's not a lie if you believe it. But uh, <laughs> the reality is, I think, um, you know, it's careful, it's careful political speech to push things in certain well, ways. Well, Teresa and I were just wondering because when we received something in the mail, yep. and she looked at it, and she said, this is a flat out lie. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know how that, how that is able to 
Well, and I think a big point can be made about contradiction. I mean, the word woman isn't used, and that's purposeful. You've got to know who the authors are, and it talks about pregnant patient. You know what's, you know what's coming next, right? Okay. Well, I was just going to say, interestingly enough, the president of the League of Women Voters had a letter in the dispatch prior to Saturday in which she says, this amendment does not violate any parental rights at all. That's just wrong. And I thought, the first time there's a lawsuit, will we ask them to fund the parents in court? Because apparently they're taking the position, which is false. But I would anticipate, and this will be Greg Malachar probably, maybe a tiny bit, that right now Planned Parenthood has a second trimester 16-year-old ready to go to the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center 30 days after November 7th, on December 7th, and they're going to walk in and they're going to say, this young lady's going to kill herself if you don't get that out of her, and you may not call her parents. I assume that's going to happen. Yeah, they'll push the boundaries as quickly as possible, which is why when we start thinking long term, the, the groups that defend religious freedom, probably for doctors and other treating individuals, will be the last refuge. Because there, at least, you can implicate their freedom of religious belief, which prohibits them from participating in this. And at least you have a way that. And I think you begin to stoke public outrage. What I'm hoping is if this passes within a relative short period of time, because the crazies will push the boundaries, there's the opportunity for round two pointing out all the excesses. Because once people realize what they've done, right. they will not be happy. Yeah, I mean, Fortunately, all of the stuff that, that Greg and I have gone through that you, or that Greg mostly went through that is clearly, this will happen, this is what this does. That doesn't preclude arguing against it in, in court. So it doesn't preclude arguing that, you know, there are other cases where an individual might be used in a bill and it actually doesn't mean minors. But we can't bank on those things, which is, evidenced by the way that it happens to be written. So there, there is an opportunity for some of that. I just think that it will be pretty unsuccessful in, in most cases. But if you look at Michigan as a model right now, they're trying to repeal the, the parents' rights legislation that they have on the books there. And you could look at that and say, well, see, the, the amendment didn't actually get rid of parental rights. But that's not even what the ACLU is saying about it. What they're saying is, well, we now have a law that is invalid because of our constitutional amendment. And so rather than let them fight it out in court where one woman could be denied her rights or one individual could be denied her rights, we should just repeal the law and make it quite clear. And this is the same people who in Michigan said the same thing is being said now in Ohio, which is this doesn't affect parental rights. The last line of the amendment, could you just read it and then explain it for me? Because it that seems- is, That is self-executing? Yes, I just- all, all that means is, is it goes, I believe under the Constitution, it goes into effect without any further action 30 days after a positive vote on November 7th. It doesn't mean anything. The need but there's sign, nothing else has to be yeah, doesn't have to be signed. No, nothing, nothing, nothing else has to be done. I have a question. This is more of a pastoral question. Um, I think uh, for, for all of us here, probably preaching to the choir in yep. terms of you know voting against issue one. Um, what do you think are the ways that this group should act with courage and boldness in terms of between now and voting day in in what we do and what we say and engaging people because um, I think if 
if the polling is correct, mm -hmm. if people understood the issue, there would be many people who are actually pro-choice who would oppose the implications of some of what you've <coughs> talked about. Right. So what do you think we should do? Since it's a pastoral question, do you want to answer your own question? <laughs> <laughs> pastoral answer. You just answered my question with a question, just like Jesus. <laughs> no, I, I I have some thoughts, but I want to hear what you guys think. Like. What or how? That's your question. How should we engage people, neighbors, friends on this matter um, in a way that is persuasive and isn't demonizing people? that reveals some of the radical nature of this? How, how would you do it? Um, well, first, in some cases, you need to prompt questions, which means that if you're in a conversation with somebody, um, you need to not be afraid, so that it's not totally out of left field, to actually engage on these type of matters. So, you know, um, there are a number of things that, you know, society says we're not supposed to talk about. We should forget about that because we don't leave our Christian faith at the door. And so, you know, if there's an opportunity to talk about issue one with somebody, we should take it. But we should start by asking questions about what they happen to think about it. And then we should ask them why they think about those things that particular way. And hopefully God opens the door to have a broader conversation on that where we can explain why we have the view of it that we do. Also think we can start some of those conversations or be a little bolder or more direct um, we need the, I mean, we do have signs over there. I don't know that um, signs do a whole lot more than um, maybe giving comfort to those around us to be a little bit more bold, but that can be a good thing too, right? That we, we let people know when we put a sign in the yard that they who are feeling that there's something squirrely about this are not the only ones. And that can generate other conversations that maybe we don't even know about or we're not involved in. Um, we can also pray, of course, and we should always do that. Um, because you know, if you believe the polling, and, and admittedly the polling is negative in part because um, the opposition to issue one is less well-funded and had a later start and is working out of the um, resultant confusion from the other issue one in August. Which is okay. I mean, I had a conversation with someone. Well, okay, so I was I was for issue one in August, and I'm against issue. Is that right? And and it is confusing. And so I do think that the polling could shift a little bit with some of the campaigns that are out there now. But it's going to have to shift a lot, and that will take a work of God through His church. And so that means not only voting on this ourselves; it means being willing to have those conversations. Anything you want to add to that, Greg? Or I, I, I have two suggestions. Um, people have to read this thing. I mean, the first question I ask them is, "Have you read it?" Yeah. And ninety percent of the time, they say no. On on David Yost's website, he he actually quotes that somebody came up to him and said, "Well, I'm not worried about issue one because we've still got the heartbeat bill." He's like, uh, "No, you don't, <laughs> or you won't." Um, so I, I really have it now. Well, maybe not. Um, so I think people need to read it, and that's the first thing I've said to people, including my family members. Have you read it? Well, no. Well, you need to read it. We, we can't have an intelligent conversation until we know what we're both talking about. Um, you know, personally, and I used it with a family member of mine who happens to be at a state medical healthcare institution who's going to have to deal with this on November 7th and thereafter because I have state is a subdivision of the state of Ohio. So they've got a different problem than nationwide for a private hospital is going to have. They don't have big problems figuring this out. Their lawyer has written 18 pages on this. So I told that person, read what your lawyer says about it. You don't have to take my word for it. Nobody's got to take my word for it. That's why I've invited you to read it. It's well written by his army of attorneys. And you've got the top cop in the state who's worried to death about this thing. So send them there. And I think from a practical perspective, the two sided that shows you the amendment and it shows you the language on the next page. Write friends and family and say, hey, 
I've been looking at this carefully, and hey, guess what? I'm, I'm suddenly worried about this. Because yeah. to me, that's that's a, the easiest way to reach people on something that's complicated. I, I agree. I think that, that handout is absolutely an outstanding tool. You really, it, it points your right to the issues. So. And you're talking about the, what we have in the back, the handout, yeah, yeah, that, handout that, that exactly. kind of breaks down the language. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It says this isn't true or it doesn't define. That, we got that in the mail. Yeah. Yeah. I, I should look. I still it, you know, uh, at, the, at the top of it is the um, source line. I can't remember um, whether it's what Chris Green or Chris Green. It's just the bottom. If you signed up for an absentee ballot, you would normally get this too. It's uh, the Ohio Browns. Does it say at the bottom who? Who printed that? that. Yeah. Yeah. I can't really read it. The American Who was it? American Policy. Policy. Yeah. Round yeah. Round yeah. Round yeah. Round yeah. Round yeah. But I'm talking about this one, Pastor David, Pastor Ken. This one, yeah. we have in the back yeah. of the room. It's essentially the same thing. The nice thing is it gives you the language, and then it has the commentary on the back, so you can see and compare. I think that what we can do, again, assuming that in this room is the core of who agrees with this and believes in this, there are probably people in our church who don't know or are confused or don't want to talk about it. So these are conversations that we could have with people in church. I also think social media is a great place to, um, I thought about, I got a, I got a mailer that says yes on issue one and has all these very misleading things to just put a picture on there and then just bullet points saying this is this is actually not true here, this is not true here, this is not true here. So, and then for people who really are pro-choice but who would recoil at an eight and a half month pregnant woman killing her baby, like this is going to open the door for that. So having that conversation with people who are pro-choice hopefully would, would um, gain some traction. But I, I, you know, from the governor's office, um, it was quite clear that the polling, if we are not bold in this, it's, it's not going to go well. And obviously you gotta pick your spots and you can't like, I don't know, there, there's, it's easy to offend and we probably will if we put things out there on social media and otherwise. But man, I walked to the church here and as I walked past, um, two doors down, yes, on issue one. Door after another door, then another one, yes, on issue one. and. I do think signs, they harden the people who are out there who are a little bit more timid. Maybe for you, putting that out there is a very like bold next step for you. I would encourage you to take one of those signs and, and put it out there. So, But we also want to remember that what, what Ken said is absolutely true. We love people who disagree with us. We don't, we don't demonize anybody. We demonize the laws that are demonic and that are going to kill babies, but we don't demonize people. Well, I, I, I assume, uh, unlike Michigan, if, if, if they're trying to perfect this model, I would take the position that this constitutional amendment has, has wiped out all of the statutes that I just talked about. And then, I mean, it, it's going to be litigated. I mean, what it means. It, it inevitably is. I gave you a scenario. I, I'm certain they're planning on it. Um, and I'm sure our schools are going to be next. Um, it'll get litigated. Right. I don't think successful for them. Well, I mean, just from a constitutional law perspective, like you could try to get the opposite thing on the ballot to repeal it. That would be almost impossible. Um, why? 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 It costs a lot of money to get it. And on, it does. You have to really now pay solicitors to go door to door unless you have a massive grassroots. And that hasn't happened in a long time in the history of passing events. You want to call on her name? Lisa. Similar, similar question. Is there any movement to reverse the vote in August? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, I know. I mean, 
What do you mean to put it up again? The vote in August? Okay. All right. I, I haven't heard anything yeah. from either the legislature that tried to do it or from a, 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 a voter initiative. Yeah. Well, David mentioned signs. We were at a funeral from Sunbury at a church. It was loaded with, quote, no, you could almost have a trip on them to get in. <laughs> Is this church going to do anything like that? Since you have your neighbors, I know you don't want to offend a neighbor, but mm -hmm. if we're a church, we need to stand for something, and I don't think there's anything more important. Right Preach now. it. Yeah. <laughs> Funny answer to that question. Mm -hmm. Is the question, are we going to put signs in our yard, in the churchyard? Yeah, I mean, this church has the entrance, they were almost overlapping each other. It was, vote, no, vote, no, vote. You couldn't look at the church. It was an interesting Catholic church. John Newman's, St. John Newman Catholic Church. Yeah. It's a great question. Honestly, I hadn't thought about that other than what we as individuals are doing. Yeah, we can't put signs where we are because we're in a condo and we're not allowed to put signs in there. Put it in your window. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can't have a for sale sign. No. At any rate, that would be an elder decision, and I can't speak on behalf of the elders right now what, How do what we, we would do. The elders? You can send an email. To who? To the elders. Uh, send it to me and address it to the elders and I'll forward it. Yeah. We'll try to get a lot of people to do that. And then you had your hand up a couple of times. I, well, I know, Greg, you were talking about how if someone wanted to put up a constitutional amendment, that all they would need would be 50 percent. Why? No, to, to vote it in only requires a simple majority vote. Right. So it requires 50% plus one vote. That's once it's on the ballot. Okay. To get it on the ballot only requires the requisite amount of signatures in 44 of the 88 counties, which the requisite amount, correct me if I'm wrong, is 5% of whatever the total votes were in the last gubernatorial election. So why do you think that it would be so difficult to repeal this? If once people saw what they thought was going to happen wasn't happening. I think two things. Money would be one. As I said in 2009, um, Dan Gilbert pumped $50 million into the campaign and Planned Parenthood and the National ACU, ACLU, have that type of money to do those things. Um, I think that's number one. I think number two, I, I think the proponents of this have done such a good misinformation campaign that they've scared half of the people in the states because of the fact that there are no um, exceptions for rape and incest. And, and that those are the issues that burn in people's minds. Um, I mean, in, 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 theoretically, it could work. Um, I don't think so. First, I wanted to let you know that the Washington Exactly that. Um, 
And then what Greg was relating to in terms of the governor's office is when, when I, um, David and I both had the, the opportunity, the governor had a bunch of pastors in to, to meet and talk about this. And one of the things that he said was, um, even if we believe that that's what it's about, we have more than enough reasons to vote this down without even getting to that. And the reason that he counseled that, and this, this might be a good thing to remember for those types of conversations, is um, at our current time and in our current culture, um, when we bring up that issue of transgenderism, we are often viewed as a alarmist and um, I guess I'll just leave it there, alarmist, that we're trying to talk, speculate about all the things that could happen out of this particular amendment. And we don't need to do that for fear that we might actually turn people off from listening to all the reasons that we know for sure the amendment is bad. Does that, does that make sense? So, you know, use your own Holy Spirit-led judgment in conversations, but that, but that may not be the best thing to push on even though I don't agree, don't disagree with the sentiment that it's baked into the, the amendment itself. About the parental rights issue. Yep. And it, this gets a pretty way our laws are developing. One example: you go to the grocery store, the kid that's at the checkout, running the checkout, is 17 and a half. He can't run a bottle of wine over the scanner, even though it's closed and corked and going in a bag without somebody coming over to him. But if he wants to make a life-changing decision that's unalterable, he can do that. And I think that's insane. And I think we need to point those things out. I completely agree. I rarely have two lawyers in the front of the room. I get to take a shot at it. <laughs> there are others. There are others. In well, 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 I'm glad in a in the law enforcement officer too. I'm happy, I'm happy with that. Well, my question is: This seems to go much higher than even what we're talking about. I felt for the last five years, our country is becoming lawless. It's a lawless society. We sat here and we've looked at all of these points, and if I go through any one of these five papers, I don't have to go very far to say, stop it. This is not the right world. This, must, this has to be another world. The place is coming unglued. And at some point in 1700 and something, a group of citizens decided that it was lawless and they did something about it. Do we no longer have the courage or the insight or the wisdom to understand? And do we feel so weak that we can't, I can take a hundred signs tomorrow and put them wherever you want. Give me a thousand. I've got, a time, I've got time to do it. Are we calling anybody to do that? As the church, uh, there was a suggestion for 10 around the corner here, right? I'm not sure. I just, I just sort of feel like all of us in here are saying, we want to do something. Give me the mission. I'll ride in police cars if that'll help the cops. <laughs> it probably won't, it'd be in danger. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I know when COVID came around, it was 24 seven TV, we're all dying. We had the governor, we had everybody standing up. This is no less of a threat to our existence. It's probably a larger threat because there are babies involved who have no rights. There's nobody speaking up there today for the unborn. Who's defending them in court? Does anybody care? Where are the fathers in all of this discussion? They're not in any legislation. They have no responsibility, and, and many of them are in prison, right? I, I don't know. It's just you sense my frustration. I know you all are similarly frustrated too. So I'll, I'll default to where I should have gone, which is prayer. We can pray and we can fill up that new auditorium with people praying if we call them and we're sincere about it. If we believe that God is in charge, Moses was in exile. He didn't worry about Pharaoh. He called on God. Thank you for doing this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay.
That's it. Yeah, let me let me press. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Father God, we do um, confess that uh, we have frustration when we see a world that shirks and um, and turns away at your commands. And um, uh, we confess that even in our own hearts and in our own lives, God, we often um, don't believe that you have the best of intentions for us. And, um, and uh, I pray that you would reveal that to us and what that might be. Um, but I also pray, God, that on this issue, um, uh, that you would cause your people to rise up in a way that maybe uh, many of us in this room might be uncomfortable with, but feeling called to do so, whatever that might be. And um, I pray that we would represent a boldness and a confidence in Christ that um, uh, we need to love our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren, even if we don't have them yet, because um, that's what you call us to do. And you know who they are in, in your divine mind, um, and you have an appointment for them. Uh, and in this society. And so I pray that we would not hesitate to do whatever small piece we can um, to make change in a world that uh, has turned sideways uh, and backwards. And I pray, God, that as we would do that, that that confidence would be found in knowing um, that your will will not be thwarted and that the church will stand forever. Uh, we pray for our land. And we pray that um, we pray that voters would go to the polls in November, and that they would make a decision that holds up the gift of those who bear your image, and not uh, tears it down or casts it aside as if it weren't a gift at all. Change the hearts of those that may feel that way, or the most, or those that may elevate specific circumstances um, over your. Uh, divine ability and appointment to use even the most dire circumstances um, to bring blessing. And we see that most clearly at the cross of your son. We pray in his name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.